let's go ahead and, uh, and start. We, last time we were together, we talked a little bit about, uh, just initially about boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. Today we're going to actually do some uh, calculations with that. But this is a conceptual picture of what is happening. So this solid line is the phase diagram for, um, for water in this case. And what happens is, is that when we add um, something, so pure water, this is pure water right there, okay? And you have to understand the, 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 when things are pure, we can actually measure a vapor pressure. We can actually measure things. Um, and so we know, in fact, that this is true. If you start adding stuff, um, then you don't have pure um, vapor or, okay, or pure, pure liquid. And so you can affect the vapor pressure, you can affect the boiling point, you can affect the freezing point. So in this case, if you look at this, the dotted line or the dashed line here is where we slide down as we add more and more um, or as we reduce the mole fraction of the pure compound by adding salt, by adding something, it slides right down this curve right here. Okay, so this kind of widens like this, slides down, and if we look at then, folks, remember, one atmosphere is boiling. Okay, so this line out here, as we drop it this way, moves that direction. This line moves this way. This is one atmosphere, and so the boiling point actually increases, and look at what happens here. This slides this way, the freezing point decreases. Okay, so this is the conceptual, this is the picture of what's happening. We call this the delta temperature of the boiling point. So this is delta Tb here, meaning how much does it change? And this is the delta of the freezing point. You notice that this is, in water's case, this is bigger than this. Okay. So this is what's actually happening. And now we're going to go ahead and, and, and look at some of the, uh, um, I've sort of said this. You got to know this, folks. Right there. Write it down. Nice and simple. M moles, okay? Moles. Case of B, I have to give you, okay? I have to give you that. It's different for everything. Although that's not quite, that is true, but I don't have to give it to you. Okay? I could ask you to calculate it. In fact, right now I want you to calculate it, okay? If delta T is equal to a half a degree C, so 0.5 C, and you have 10 molar, what is case of B? So 0.5 here, and this is a 10. Easy. So all you got to do, once again, folks, I have to give you or you have to have information that allows you to know two out of three, okay? So as long as you know 0 0.5 degrees here and 10 molar here, you can figure out what case of B is. And what is case of B in that case? Who got the answer? 0 0.05, okay? So case of B is going to be, and what units? We got degrees over here and we've got moles here, okay? So it's going to be um, degrees per mole or per mole out, okay? So once again, you can calculate this, all right? Don't freak out if you're asked a question where you're given the temperature change and the molality or I could ask you the molality, okay? If temperature change, folks, is, I'm going to make, yes, really loud, depends. Okay, if I just ask for the change in temperature, one degree Kelvin is one degree Celsius. Okay, so anytime you're, anytime you're talking about deltas, 
you know, unless I specifically say, what is the temperature change in Kelvin or what is the temperature change in Celsius? That, uh, but you can't use Well, I guess you could use Fahrenheit. If, if I was asking, if I were asking you what is the case of B and I said that this is one degree Fahrenheit, then you would give me the case of B in Fahrenheit, but uh, I wouldn't do that. So once again, folks, all kinds of permutations here as to what I can ask, simple questions, simple math. Okay. So as, as she said over here, the units then are going to be in degrees C per mole hour, okay, or degrees K, doesn't matter. Does everybody understand why it doesn't matter? Okay. Well, I guess I should say, does anybody not understand? Okay, do this using the equation that I just gave you. Take out your calculators and do this problem. Okay, so just in case you don't know, nitrogen is 14. So this whole thing is 14 plus 3 is 17. See what the answer is. Once again, it never hurts to just have a little bit of a clue as to what you think it's going to be, okay? So look at this. I said that 17 grams per mole for this. Everybody got that? So that's not quite a mole, okay? 11 grams, 17 grams, this is half a mole or, or whatever. Uh, half to one mole. And it's over 200 grams of water. For mole isles, it's supposed to be over a kilogram. So that's 0.2 kilograms right there. So it's about 0.5 moles, 0.7 moles over 0.2. So you're going to have a molality of like two and a half or three or something like that. So it's then going to be three times this. So you should have a number around one and a half degrees. Let's see if I'm right. Okay, so here's, so you got about two thirds of a mole divided by 0.2 kilograms. So you got 3.3 molal, 3.3 times 5.2, about 1.7. So we got that? How many want me to slow down? How many think they got that? Okay, all right. So once again, it's a very simple, straightforward calculation, okay? Nothing tricky about it. Now folks, I can get, I can make it a lot trickier, okay? Um, but, uh, but, so delta T, that could be a, 174, 1.74 K, 1.74 C. I don't see any reason to change things, folks. If I give you Tor, if I give you a clausius clapeyron equation and I give you Tor, um, you know, I wouldn't, 
you know, I'd leave it in tour, okay, unless I ask what is the atmosphere, what is in atmospheres, what is it in bars, whatever, okay. Okay, now we're, we just did this one, we're going to do this one now, okay, and it's the same thing, okay, but the K is different, okay. The effect that something has on the boiling point is not necessarily the same effect. They're, they're, they're going opposite directions. You're lowering the freezing point and you're raising the boiling point. But they don't have the same K sub or Ks. There it is. Same equation, okay. In this case, delta T of fusion or freezing is equal to K sub F times the molality. Write that down because you're going to have a problem to do right now. So delta T sub F, freezing or fusion, I don't care what you call it, um, is K sub F times the molality. Same as before, degrees per molal, do this. Everybody should be calculating this. If you just watch me do it, I don't think it's as effective. How do you know which one is solute and which one is solvent? Whichever's bigger is the solute. Or the solvent, I mean, sorry. So we've got calculate the freezing point of a solution of five grams of this and that many grams of this dissolved in 200. This is your solvent right here. Solvent's always the big one. And what you don't know is, is that these are both solids. This is a solid and this is a solid, okay? And so this is the only thing that's, that's a liquid. It's the only thing with a vapor pressure. Once again, calculate the freezing point of a solution of 5 grams of diphenyl C12H10 and 7.5 grams of naphthalene C10H8 dissolved in 200 grams of benzene. It has a freezing point of 5.5. So similar to uh, water, but it's got a big case of F, okay? So once again, if we, we have to figure out the mole fraction, right? We have to figure out the mole. So we've got 5 grams divided by 154 grams per mole plus 7.5 grams divided by 128. So we've got about 0.1 moles or uh, uh, mole owls, no moles of, uh, uh, of these two things that we're then putting in to 0.2 kilograms, okay? So the molality is about 0.45. Here's that equation again. And you remember what the case of F was. I think it was 5.12 degrees uh, per molal. So that's 5.12 times this. Delta T is going to be about 2 degrees, okay? So delta T is going to be 2 degrees. 
Now, don't forget, I'm not sure what the question was, but if it asks what is the new freezing point, then you have to take whatever that change in temperature was, if it's two or three degrees, subtract it from 5.5. Okay, so let's see. Yep, look at that. Okay, so you have the molality here, you got this here, delta T is equal to 2.33. Subtract it from this. How many got 3.17? Good. Okay, now, so folks, on an exam, once again, you have to get the whole answer. All right? So if you had just gotten this, you'd get maybe this is a six point question. Now, I don't know. What do you think, Joe? Is that three or four points? Okay. You know, I, I, once again, it's simple then to subtract this from that. All of you can do it, but that's the answer. So make sure you read the question. Make sure that you know what is being asked because I might ask, you know, how many moles of this, or how many grams of this, you get it all the way to the end. Now, if you go past it, okay, let's just say there's some calculation where the question is how many grams of, you know, sugar and you get that exact answer and then you go past that and you give me actually what the number of moles was of that, I will just go ahead and give you full credit for that, okay, um, because you, you, you work through it. We'll see. I might take off one point for being a knucklehead. Yeah. Okay. Colligative properties. Okay. So, what's interesting with these boiling point, freezing point, all these things, is that <coughs> some things break into two pieces. All right, look at this. Sodium chloride, NaCl, Na plus Cl minus. Okay, so we have electrolytes and we have non-electrolytes. A non-electrolyte is something that when you put it into the solution, into the solvent, it doesn't break apart. It dissolves like sugar, okay? Sugar, in, a, in, in, in like granulated sugar, you put it in water and it disappears, right? Okay, it disappears, but it stays exactly as glucose at 180 grams per mole. Sodium chloride breaks into two pieces. Sodium chloride. We call this an electrolyte because look at this. You got a negative charge here and a, pos or a positive charge here, a negative charge here. You put that in salt. If you had a water bath where you had an electrode here and an electrode here um, and you measured the potential across it, okay, you're not going to get a lot of electricity going through that water. Okay, not nearly as much if you start dumping some salt into it. Okay, because then you have all these ions that can carry a current one way or another. Okay, so that's what we call this an electrolyte. An electrolyte is something that actually breaks apart. Non-electrolyte is just sugar. Okay, so look at this. We have one mole out of this, but we end up with one mole out of this and one mole out of this. We have to consider that, okay? So, colligative properties are properties that depend only on the number of solute particles, okay, and not the nature of the solute particles. So, one molal sodium chloride, two molals of ions, right? Because we have one molal from the chloride and one molal from the sodium. So, you actually have two molals of ions. And what we have is what we call the Von, ha Van Hoft factor. And it's actually, yes? Um, is that why salt water is a great conductor of electricity? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's not great, but it's better. Salt water conducts electricity better than water, than pure water, okay? There are other things that conduct even better, but yes, um, the more salt you put in something, the better it conducts electricity. So this Van Hoft, okay, um, is the actual number of particles, okay? So it's sort of like the actual number, which is one, you have one of these, let's say, and it breaks into two. Oh, sorry, the actual number of particles, sorry, it's the opposite. Actual divided by, if it weren't um, dividing into two. So this would be, for this one, it's gonna be two over one, um, and you get a two for Van Hoff for that. So for non-electrolytes, folks, they don't break apart. You put the sugar in, it stays the sugar, so the Van Hoff factor is one, okay? 
NaCl is two. What if you have something that's got three or four things on it? Like calcium chloride. You get one calcium that comes off as a plus two. You get two chlorides. So it actually breaks in to three pieces. Okay? So it's very important. Now, on an exam, folks, I will either say it's an electrolyte or it's a non-electrolyte. And if it's an electrolyte, I would have to tell you that it is completely dissolved. Okay? Assume 100% dissociation. Okay? So if I said sodium chloride, um, you know, is, is uh, completely dissociated, then the Van Hoff factor would be two. Okay? Unless I'm asking you to calculate the Van Hoff. Okay? But in this case, in, 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 in most cases where I'm just uh, asking a specific question, then I would have to say that it's completely dissociated. And in that case, if you've got calcium chloride, you'd need to know that that goes to three. Okay? So here are just some constants. These are just, you don't need to know these. These will be given to you on the exam. But if we look at the freezing point, case of F, water 1.86. Look at benzene, three times more. So you, you can lower the freezing point of benzene by a factor of three with the same amount of, of um, um, you know, uh, sol uh, solute um, as you can with water. Look at this one, cyclohexane is huge. Okay, and these are the ones for making the boiling point go higher. You notice that these tend to be smaller than these. Okay, but they'll be given. They'll be given to you. This is just to show that they're all different. Okay. Okay, osmotic pressure. This is another equation you're going to need to know. It's, yeah, I, I kind of think osmotic pressure is, is, is pretty cool. Okay. You have a a semi-permeable membrane. That means that certain things can go through, like look at this. You notice that the red things are too, too big to go through the holes, okay? Too big to go through the holes, but the, in this case we're going to act like this is water. So here's the water. The water can get through these little holes or channels. The, um, um, the solute can't, okay? So this is sodium chloride or something like this. You've got the, uh, the uh, electrolytes here and they can't get this way. Okay. But the solvent can go either direction. And so what you have is you have this semi-permeable membrane and what happens is um, if you have the solvent on this side and then you've got the solution over here, um, things want to move in this direction. Okay. Things can move this way because they're trying to, to uh, um, I'm not sure that we, we haven't talked about Le Chatelier. We, anyway, trust me, they do that. So we can calculate the osmotic pressure. Okay, and it's the osmotic pressure is going to be dependent on what is the concentration here of the actual solute. Okay? And, um, These folks are not um, very strong, okay? I'll tell you a story now. So when I was in the fourth grade, I, we, had, we grew up on a kind of old McDonald farm. You know, we had chickens and pigs and goats and that kind of stuff. Um, but um, Renee Marinkovich had a, an egg farm. And um, so she brought in, it turns out that every now and then a chicken lays an egg that doesn't have a shell on it. Okay. Anybody ever heard of that? Nobody. Okay. You have. Okay, good. So what happens is you get that, if you've ever like done a, a, a boiled egg and you start peeling off the shell, sometimes there's like that really, really thin little, almost like a plasticky rubber. How many of you ever noticed that? I don't, you know. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's what holds the yolk and the white and stuff inside the shell. Okay, well it turns out that every now and then chickens lay, I don't know why, if it's the same chicken always or what, but uh, um, a completely calciumless egg. Okay, 
and it's got just a little bit of, uh, you can kind of squeeze it. Uh, anyway, we got to pass it around in class. It's a big deal and, uh, when you're fourth grade. And, uh, and then our teacher just put it in a thing of water, okay? And it was not hard, okay? In other words, how many have ever noticed that when you boil an egg, there's usually like a little part that is like missing? You ever notice, I mean, you ever notice that like on the end, there's like a, a little dimple, okay? You ever notice that? How many of you have ever, come on, raise your hand, that, that it's not perfectly shaped like an egg. There's like a little, okay. That's because that little membrane, that it's not completely full inside the egg. So you take away, inside the shell, so you take away the shell and you can kind of squeeze it. Okay, it had like maybe a cc or so of, of volume. Must have freaked her out. So, uh, so anyway, the tea, so you could squeeze it and there was a little bit of volume. So he puts this in um, a thing of water. Really? <laughs> At least somebody's interested. <laughs> and guess, now no, no you, say, you, you shouldn't say really after I say this part. And then after a couple hours, he pulled it out and it was hard. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, really. And it was because of this. Okay, you had the semi-permeable membrane that the water molecules could go through, but the other stuff, the proteins and whatever else was in there, couldn't. And so it could kind of slowly go through here and it actually just filled it up to where it was, you know, had water in it. Okay, big deal. So the story didn't go over very well, but as a fourth grader, I thought it was pretty cool. But you can generate this pressure here and that's called the, called the osmotic pressure and that's what I'm going to expect you to be able to calculate. Now, here's something that you, I should get a really out of. If I have a closed system and I've got something with just like pure water and I've got something that got pure water and solvent, I mean some stuff in it, some salt let's say, and this is closed off, the next day, guess what it looks like this. This is completely gone. Completely gone. Magic. Can I get a really? Yeah. And that's because, once again, here's a good question. Do this. Oh, never mind. We'll do one in a minute. This is pure. Okay, if we go back to something that we did uh, last class, um, if the vapor pressure of water at room temperature is 20 degree, or is, is 20 torr, Okay, pure water at room temperature is 20 torr, and we add some stuff to it. Remember, it was like P is equal to um, some chi or X times P0. Okay, and that chi is the mole fraction. So if we add a whole bunch of salt or something to this, and it turns out that the pressure from this has less pressure than this. Okay, this is pure, this is not pure. So this has a higher vapor pressure, more water molecules jump out of here and just get up here, and then this has lower vapor pressure, they jump into here, you can actually make that happen. Okay. You don't care. There was a 60s term that I almost just said, but I swore last night in class, so that's probably not a good idea. Here it is. Write it down, you don't care. You'll care on Thursday, folks. So, the vapor, the, the, the osmotic pressure. Now, folks, okay, everybody stop. I got to warn you. This is the one time that we use molar. That's a big M. Moles per liter, not molal. Don't screw that up. Molar. I actually happen to like molars a lot easier. There's a lot easier to calculate. Then R and T. Now, if this is pressure that we're talking about, what R do you think we're going to use? No. 0 0.08205 liter atmospheres per degree mole. That's got pressure in it, okay? So, molarity and an R that has the, uh, the one that we'd use with the universal gas constant and PV equals nRT.
What pressure of what system? Okay, so what we had, this, I, I, I've got one, I've got an example, I think the next, the next one. Okay, so here's the osmotic pressure. So you've got something that's one molarity or molarity of one and here's the pure solvent, okay? So which way are things going to flow? The solvent, the, the solute stuff can't get through that, those holes. So things are always going to go this way. And the difference between the level of this and this, so we start off at the same, the difference between here and here is going to be the osmotic pressure. Look at that. That's the osmotic pressure right there, okay? There it is. Okay, sorry about the R there. This is, uh, this is given to me by your, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But that's what happened. That is the difference. The difference right there is the osmotic pressure and we're calling that pi. Okay, do this. So here's the equation right there. How many of you received an email from me last night? How many don't know? How, raise your hand. It's okay. If you don't know, you didn't get. How many didn't check your email between about eight o'clock last night and right now? Okay. So I sent you today's notes. Okay. Because the class, the last night's class that I taught, because they've got an exam tomorrow, um, I'd said that I'd get the notes posted last or today, and they said, "Oh, that's too late." So, uh, so check on your, you know, the, they haven't, probably haven't been posted on the website, but they should have gone to everybody because I sent it to both classes. Check your email a couple times a day. Who knows, I might do something crazy and like say so there's going to be an exam or something on Thursday. <laughs> or say, what? Pay attention. Okay. <clears throat> so, the average osmotic pressure of seawater Okay, this is one of these wordy, wordy word problems that has way too much stuff in it. Okay, all this isotonic stuff, blah, blah. So, the question is calculate the molar concentration, molar, moles per liter, aqueous solution of sucrose that is isotonic with seawater. Okay, isotonic just means that it's got the same osmotic pressure. Okay, so that means that this value right here is a 30. 30 atmospheres right there. Okay. So, 30 atmospheres, we're tr calculating this, we know what this is, and we know what this is. Does it get any simpler? No. You just rearrange, you got M on one side, you got pi on the other, so you just take this RT onto this side, over here, so it's going to be pi over RT, 30 atmospheres, 0 0.8201 liter atmospheres per degree mole, times the 298, there it is right there, the molarity that you need to generate 30 atmospheres is 1.23 molar. Simple. Do we agree? Okay. Anybody want me to do this again or talk about this? It's very straightforward, but you have to remember, folks, it's the only one, the only equation that we'll be using probably for cha chapter 8 and chapter 9 where we're using molarity. Okay, so that's the trick, okay, is molarity. It's not a trick. It's just, that's life. Okay, do this. <clears throat> well,
Last night, somebody asked me what intravenous meant. Mm. For all you doctor wannabes, it means in your veins. And in case you've forgotten, carbon is 12, hydrogen is 1, oxygen is 16. So folks, you've got that right there. That's the pressure, okay? You got the pressure, you got the temperature. So all you gotta do is figure out the molarity. Pretty darn easy. So don't forget, you gotta have it in Kelvin, okay? Those delta T's were changes. Anytime you use a T, it's Kelvin. So we have 310. Van Hoft was one because it's a non-electrolyte. So we got this, we'll, well, I'll let you know what this I is in a minute, we, we haven't talked about that too much, but uh, this would be the Van Hoft, which is a one, and so that's what they've got a one here for. But basically you've got pi is equal to um, I over RT, and M is equal to this many atmospheres times the one, uh, times this divided by that. The molarity is 0.3, okay? So how many got point three? Good, 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 good. How many got the next answer? So the question once again was how much glucose? And that's, I, I would hope on an exam I would ask it a little bit more specific. I would say how many grams of glucose or how many moles of glucose, okay? So this problem goes on and after you've got this, then there's how much glucose. Okay, you need five or 54.1 grams. And that's one where, as I said, if I ask for grams and you only give me moles, you'll lose a couple points. If I ask for moles and you give me grams and you circle this, you, you're, you're at the mercy of the TA to actually know that this, you had to have this to get this. And that may or may not happen, folks, okay? So make sure you read the problem thoroughly. Okay, got that answer. So, I, I think this is just way cool, okay? So we're talking about reverse or osmosis or, or, or osmotic pressure. So if you add more pressure, okay, look at it, you have a semi-permeable membrane here and you put salt water here, look at this. You can actually apply pressure, push this and you can actually push the water molecules through this okay, and not the salt. So you can actually make drinkable water with a device like this, okay? Now, the, the bad news, okay, is that these things generally are a little on the, the not so strong side, okay? Think of that egg that I told you about 20 minutes ago. Okay, as I said, it had about one cc of space, okay, in it, and it took a couple hours to get a one, one cc of water to go through that membrane, okay? And it's not something that if you applied a whole lot of pressure to, that it would be able to withstand a lot of pressure. So you can't have one of these things and have some super strong person, you know, do this or stand on it. It would just blow that right out, okay? So we can't have the desalina desalination plant off the, the, the coast here and 
turn salt water into drinkable water um, in a very easy fashion. It's a very slow process, okay? Um, obviously, if they could come up with something that, that was, was really good at separating out the salts on this side and on this side you get the fresh water, then a lot of our water problems, at least those of us and countries that live close to the ocean, uh, that would solve a huge problem. But I think this is pretty cool, so I'm going to make you look at it. Okay, now, Routes Law. I love Routes Law. There is a Routes Law question on the exam. We did Routes Law earlier, but that's where we had something like a salt or something that was added to a liquid. It was a one, one of the things had a vapor pressure, the other didn't. Okay, now we got two things. Two things that got a vapor pressure. Okay, so we have benzene, we have toluene. Now, mole fraction, mole fraction. I was, I got to the end of the lecture last night and a student came up to me completely confused about mole fraction, okay? So I thought I was doing a great job and then she completely bummed me out, okay? It's a 60s term. So, um, so let me just spend just a, a minute or two talking about mole fraction, okay? So, you can't have more than 100% of something. I don't care what these athletes on TV say, they gave 110%. You know, that just shows how smart they are, okay? I mean, for crying out loud, politicians say it too. Um, I mean, it's ridiculous. You give 100%, no. I've never given 100% at anything I've ever done. I mean, look. I mean, I, it's probably, I mean, it's true. I mean, I studied like a wild man at UCLA, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, but I could have studied another hour, okay? So I wasn't at 100%. So the point is, is that few of us, yeah, I don't care who you are, an Olympian, um, gave a hundred percent, maybe they would die if they did, I don't know, anyway. But you can't give more than a hundred percent, okay? You can't have more than a hundred percent. Okay, can I have more than a hundred percent class participation? Look at the seats. Do you think somebody's going to come in from archaeology and sit in this lecture? When I'm giving the lecture, heck no. They would be lost. Lost, I mean, not just lost mentally, but lost physically, okay? So 100% is the most. The mole fraction, folks, can never ever get above one, okay? The mole fraction can never get above one, okay? So I asked this young woman who came up to me, who seemed completely confused. I said, okay, look, and there were 15 people in the lecture hall. Okay, and I said, what is the mole fraction of men in this room? Okay, there were 11 men and there were five women. Okay, so 11 men, five women. I said, what's the mole fraction? She said 11. <laughs> 11? I didn't ask how many men were in the room. I said, what is the mole fraction? What is the fraction of men in the room? Okay, so let's make it easy on me. Let's say that there were 10 people in the room and there were seven men and three women. I can do that math, okay? It's gonna be seven plus three is 10. That goes to the denominator and then however many men you had, in that case seven, seven over 10. Point seven is the mole fraction of men in the room. Okay, point seven. I'm going to ask somebody in the front row, you, Nancy, what then is the mole fraction of women in that room? 0.7 for men, what is it for women? 0.3, yes. When you have two things, folks, two things, all you got to do is if you know what one of them is, you automatically know the other. If it's 0.1, the other has to be 0.9. 
If that concept is hard for you, ooh. I mean, I'm not being funny. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just saying that you got to understand, folks, that mole fraction, everything adds up to one. Okay? Now, so men and women in this room, the mole fraction is probably about 0.5 and about 0.5. Okay? Maybe. If I said, what is the mole fraction of, I've got to be careful here, um, people wearing sweatshirts versus people wearing glasses, or and people wearing glasses and something else. Now, if I tell you, if I got three things, and I say, okay, the mole fraction of people wearing sweatshirts is 0.2, then the other two or three things have to add up to 0.8, but how do I know what fraction those are? Okay, so if you're given three or four things, coming up with a mole fraction of each of them is not very easy. But two is easy. It's just whatever the mole fraction was of the one, take away from one. Does everybody get that? Okay, you better. It's on the exam tomorrow, on Thursday. So, here we have a two-component system. We have benzene and we have toluene. This is the mole fraction of benzene. Pure benzene, what this tells us is that at some temperature, okay, let's say room temperature, benzene has a vapor pressure of about 750 torr, right there. That's when it's pure benzene, 1.0, okay? 1.0, pure benzene. When there's zero benzene, then there's zero pressure for benzene, okay? So if I have zero benzene, I have no contribution to the pressure from benzene. If I have 100% benzene, it's all benzene. It's pure and that's the vapor pressure of pure benzene and therefore the vapor pressure of benzene inside this, okay? Now, let's instead say I'm going to go to mole fraction of 0.2. So it's 0.2 between benzene and it doesn't matter what else, okay? 0.2, I'm going to ask you, what do you guess or estimate, this guy right here, yeah. What are you going to, and that's a guy, what are you going to estimate is the vapor pressure contribution to the system by benzene when we are right here at 0.2? What do you think? 200, perfect answer. So, if you are at 0.2 mole fraction, you just kind of look on here and go, okay, well, it's right in, in this area right here, about 200 torr, okay? If we're at 600, or 0.6, it's about 500, okay? That's how you do this chart. This, folks, is the mole fraction for benzene, okay? There's another one down here that you can't see, because it's not here, but it should be there, where this is a zero, 0, 0.0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1.0, it's going to say chi of toluene. So this is where there's no toluene here. It's 100% benzene, 0% toluene. And then we go this way. This is 100% toluene, 0% benzene. So this is a mole fraction of one for toluene. And what is its vapor pressure at room temperature? For toluene, it's about 300. We got that? 300. Okay, so, Emney, at 0.4 mole fraction of, no, sorry, this is 0.6 mole fraction for toluene. What would be the contribution to pressure from to, for, for toluene? 200, right. Okay, and the guy next to her. What? So you're right, Emmy. 200. For you, now we're looking at what is, this was at, at, at 0.6, okay, for toluene. At, the rest has to be 0.4. So now what is the contribution of a mole fraction of 0.4 from benzene? Okay, so you add them up. 200 plus 300 is 500. Watch this. Ooh, right there. 
That line, folks, is the sum of the two. That's how this thing works, okay? Simple, okay? So all you're doing is multiplying the pure by the mole fraction, okay? And that's what all this is going to say. Right there, okay? P total is equal to the pressure from benzene, which is going to be the chi times the pure, plus the toluene, which is going to be the chi times the pure, okay? And if it's an ideal system, then that line is straight. Sometimes it looks like this and like this if it's not ideal. I like ideal things. I live in an ideal world, okay? Which makes it easier for you folks. So, once again, there's the equation right there. P total, chi A plus, uh, chi A P of, of, of the pure plus chi B of the pure B. You got that written down? Because I think we got a problem coming up. Do it. Okay, so folks, you look at this question and the first thing I want you to do is to just estimate what is the pressure, okay? What's the most the pressure could absolutely be? 94.6 torr, okay? If you had pure benzene, you'd have 94.6 torr. If you had pure toluene, you got 29 torr, okay? You can never get higher than the highest one, okay? If you go back to that chart before, you'll see that's possible, okay? It's not. So, we got almost 100 and we got 30. Then you look at it and you say, okay, which one has the highest percentage? Which has the bigger mole fraction, the toluene or the benzene? Toluene, okay? So that means there's more of this, right? A bigger number times this, okay? So that means that the answer you're gonna get is going to be closer to 29 than it is to 94. So the answer means it's going to be, that tells me the answer should be 50-ish, maybe 45 to 55 or 60, okay? Just as an estimate, okay? I know it's got to be between these two. So, and look at this. Percent, folks, how do you convert percent to mole fraction? You divide by 100. The mole fraction of toluene is point Six 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 six. So what is the mole fraction of benzene? Okay. All you got to do is subtract 0.6666 from one. Okay. So it's just going to be 0.6666 times this plus 0.3333 times this. Add them up, you get the total pressure. 
Let's see what we get. There it is right there, okay? 51, we get that? How many got that? How many, okay, good. Now, guess what, folks? I'm old, I'm cranky, and by the way, for those who come to office hours, I got to call in at noon today to see if I've got jury duty today at one o'clock. So if I'm not in a bad enough mood as it is, I might have to go to jury duty at one o'clock. Boy, pity the poor fool whose case I get on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Book. Okay. So I'm not going to give you what the mole fraction is. Why would I do that? Okay, instead I might say, well, you've got this many grams of benzene, okay, and this many grams of toluene, right? That would make it a little tougher. But still, you'd say, okay, well, I gotta divide the number of, of uh, let's do that. It's a good question. Too late for the exam, but it's similar. Okay, look at this, let's go back to this. Right there, okay? Everything stays the same, except this time, I'm gonna tell you that you have 50 grams of benzene and 50 grams of toluene. Okay, 50 grams of benzene, now write that down. 50 grams of benzene, 50 grams of toluene. The molecular formula for benzene is C6H6. C6, <laughs> I bit myself. I didn't say sex, I said six. <laughs> let, me, let me start over. <clears throat> C6H6. Toluene, C7H8. I said eight, not hate, for all you haters. <laughs> now I want to know what is the pressure, okay? So I've given you 50-50, benzene C6H6, toluene C7H8, okay? What is the pressure? Mmm. So let me help you, for those of you who are stumped. You gotta come up with a mole fraction. How many moles of benzene in 50 grams of benzene? How many moles of toluene in 50 grams of, ben of toluene? I'm asking a question. It's not a hypothetical question. Jessica, what's the answer? How many moles of benzene? You got that yet? Okay, who's got how many moles of benzene? 0 0.6, 0 0.64, is that right? Okay, so let's just, just okay, 0.64 moles of benzene. So I can tell you right now, since the molecular weight of toluene is bigger, toluene is gonna be right around 0.5. What is the moles of toluene? What do you get? 0.5435. Okay, so 0.54. Okay, so 0.54 moles of one, 0.64 moles of the other. So what do you do? You add them up. 0.64 plus 0.54 equals, you know, uh, 1.08. And then you just say, okay, 1.08. Toluene was 0.64, so it's gonna be 0.64 over 1.08. You got a mole fraction of, uh, you know, 0.60 or one, something like that. What is the answer? How about you? I count on you two guys. Point one? Okay, how many, so we're gonna add 0 0.54 plus 0 0.64. So the mole fraction of benzene is what? 0.54, okay, 0.54, and therefore the mole fraction of uh, toluene must be 0.46. Multiply by these two things. 0.54 times that, 0.46 times this, add them up, and you come up with a, a vapor pressure, a total vapor pressure. What's the answer? Golly, guy. Okay, I gotta have a new go-to person. Yes? 64.4. 64.4. Looks, I mean, at least it's between these two. So does everybody see how we did that? So this time, folks, I actually gave you a mass. And the mass, you figure out how many moles, Okay? Man, I gotta, hold on a second. I gotta check my schedule here. So I just came up with a brilliant 
a brilliant other question, but I don't know if I got time to do it. I don't, okay. Too bad. Brilliance passed, okay. So, okay, now, do this one. This one not so easy. For those of you who remember algebra, I remember uh, eighth grade math, it's easy. But unfortunately, many of you are going to have forgotten it. So in this case, folks, you've got something that's got a pure vapor pressure of 125. You got another one that's got a pure vapor pressure of 165, one of 125. And I tell you that the total is equal to this. A little bit different, a little bit tougher. Simple, simple. And after we're done, you're going to go, oh, gosh, I can't believe I didn't get this right. Is that right? What's the answer? What is it? Say it really loud. Point two. What, what, what are you guys calculating? So well, I guess I should see what the question was. What is the mole fraction of hexane? Point two. I believe you're right. So for those who forgot their, and it's okay to have forgotten something, like I said, we, we went over this earlier today that, look, here's, what, here's the equation. I gave you 133 torr. That's then going to be equal to the mole fraction of benzene times 165 torr, which was given, plus the mole fraction of toluene times 125 torr. So you know the answer, okay, this and this, if you had all of this, it would, if this was a 1, this would be 165 over here. If this then you wouldn't have, if this was a 1 here, then this would be 125. So you got 133. We know that the mole fraction of benzene plus the mole fraction of toluene equals 1. So benzene mole fraction is equal to this minus this. So this is what you do, folks. Remember the old, I say, I think eighth grade I remember this, where you say, okay, well, I'm going to sign one thing as an X and the other is 1 minus X. If you got two things, that works. If you got three things, it doesn't work. Okay, so go to here, <clears throat> you set it up, this is what you got, you, I gave you, I said the pressure of this uh, mixture is 133 torr, so it's going to be X times 165, okay, and then 1 minus X times 125. So if we multiply that all through, I, I, if I take a 125 torr times 1, I get a 125. So I move that 125 to the other side, so I've got 133 torr minus 125 is equal to, and here I've got an X times 165 and an minus X 125, so I've got that. So I can subtract that and I get 40X, subtract this, I got 8 torr, so X is equal to 8 over 40, which is equal to 0.2, okay? Since we know that benzene is the blah, 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 so we know that this is 0.2 and therefore toluene has to be 0.8. So you got it in your notes. Everybody was sent to you last night. Um, be sure you go over this, folks, because guess what's on the exam? I'm not giving you what the mole fraction is. You got to do this. 
Yeah. You get it? Okay. All right, so we're not even close to being done, so don't even think of packing up. Okay. I already said that. So, these are the equations. This is just a little overview. These are the equations that I told you you needed to know. Vapor pressure lowering. This is when you have only one component that has a vapor pressure. It's like water and sugar. Sugar has none. So you have the mole fraction times the pure is equal to the pressure. Boiling point elevation, once again, this is for non-electrolytes. Delta TB is equal to KBM. Boiling point, uh, or freezing point depression, same thing, and osmotic pressure. Okay, you've, you've gotten all these. I'm just reminding you. Okay, now, For electrolytes, they all have an I in them, folks, okay? Because electrolytes break into pieces. So it's the same equation, it's just that you've got I. And you can always use I for all, you don't have to remember the other stuff. Just remember this. But just remember that an elect, a non-electrolyte, I is equal to one, okay? For sugar, I is one. So you can just do a one there times this times this gives you that, no problem. So this is how it all works. Now, vapor pressure lowering. Okay, look, I've got a, an I and I got a question mark right there. What I'm saying is, is that how do we need to have an I in this? Okay. And the answer is sort of. It's, it's implied because of that chi right there, okay? So do this. I'm going to go to the next slide. You just keep working on it. Don't cheat. Okay, let's go over this. Once again, folks, it's all mole fraction. Everything's a mole fraction, okay? So, first question, and this seemed to throw a lot of people last night. How many, if I give you one liter of water, one liter of water, okay, I don't see a liter bottle, but I got a half a liter over here, okay? Let's just assume this is one liter. If I give you one liter of water at four degrees, it weighs one kilogram, okay? How many moles of water in my one liter of water? How many moles of water in my one liter of water? Well, there's a thousand grams in a liter. Molecular weight of water is 18. So a thousand by 18 is 55.5. So in a liter of water or one kilogram, 
there are 55.5 moles of water, okay? So that's, to do this problem, we have to know how many moles, okay? In a two molal solution of sodium chloride, okay, two molal means we got 2.2, but the sodium breaks into two pieces. So that two right there, folks, is sort of, is the, is the I, okay? It, so it's implied when we use um, uh, mole fractions. So you don't actually have an I in that equation because um, that's what chi is, okay? So look, at it. we've got total number of particles <coughs> from sodium chloride in a 2.2 uh, mole out solution is going to be 4.4 moles, okay? So if we have 4.4 moles of sodium chloride, we just now say, okay, well, I got to, for the mole fraction, remember, it's just the two together is in the denominator. So it's 4.4 from this many moles, 5.5 from that many moles, divided or, uh, with the 4.4 uh, in the numerator. So we've got this is the mole fraction of sodium chloride in that solution, okay? We then multiply that times the value we were getting of 1754 and that is the decrease in the vapor pressure, okay? How many got this right? How many would have gotten it right if I gave you more time? Okay, that's better. Um, now, So what's the problem with this? Do we, uh, yes? Okay, because it was given, you've got 2.2 mole al, right? The definition is that you've got 2.2 moles per kilogram, kilogram of water. That's the, that's the definition, okay? Now it seems simple, right? So now you got that. All right. So that's where the thousand grams came from. Okay. Now, this is how much the boiling point was lowered. Okay. I would have preferred a question to say, what is the new boiling point? Okay. In that case, instead of multiplying that pressure times the little mole fraction, you would multiply it by whatever one minus this is. So let's try that right now. Do one minus that number, you get 0.92 something. What do you get? 0.926. Now multiply 0.926 times 1754 and you get to get a number of about 16. 16 Tor. So the vapor pressure of water is now going to be 16 torr. So the way the question before was asked is, what is the decrease in the vapor pressure of water as opposed to what is the vapor pressure of the water? Okay? So two different questions. Okay, study, 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 folks. I love Clausius Clapron, I love Routes Law and Henry's Law. 